Well, welcome back, everyone. My name is Charlie Knowles, and I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, I grew up watching the National Geographic specials of Jane studying chimps in Gombe and always wanted to grow up to be her, but didn't have the opportunity to meet her until a little bit over 20 years ago when I hosted an event for her in my living room. And it was through that event that I ended up meeting Akiko Yamazaki, with whom I founded a Wildlife Conservation Network. And from the very beginning, Jane was actively involved in helping us. She came to one of the very first expos. And here, 20 years later, she is um, coming and attending her 10th expo, albeit virtual this time. And it's my great privilege and honor to invite to the stage my dear friend, Dr. Jane Goodall. Well, thank you, Charlie. And, um... Thank you. And I, I just wish that it was in person because virtual hugs and kisses aren't the same. No. And, <laughs> but anyway, it's it's lovely to be yes, it's it's lovely to be um to be back even if it's virtual. And well, we just had to get used to that, haven't we? It's our new modus operandi. For a little bit longer. I mean the there are some upsides to it. We're we have thousands of people from over 60 countries attending, which couldn't do it uh, otherwise. But uh, yeah, I like the in-person better. It's kind of ironic that uh, last year we were at the Masonic Auditorium in San Francisco with 3,000 people. And now we're both sitting alone doing it again. But yeah. we, uh, we're all here together in spirit. Um, but lovely to see you. And I understand you're at your home in home in England and what's it like not traveling 300 days a year? Well yes this is the house where I grew up so a lot of the books and things are books I had as a child. It was my grandmother's house so I've even got some of her books and mum's books and you know so it's really my roots here and it was jolly lucky that I was grounded when I was here rather than in some far-flung part where I wouldn't have particularly wanted to stay. Um, at the start, I was frustrated and angry because I couldn't travel. And then my little team, JGI team, decided to create a virtual Jane. And, you know, the advantage is that I've uh, been able to reach millions more people this way and go to many more countries. The disadvantage is you don't get the face to face. A huge disadvantage for me is having to give lectures, looking at that little light, that little camera on the top of my laptop, uh, instead of in an auditorium where you feel the energy and the buzz. So it, it's been a difficult thing to do. But my days are, you know, I've never worked as hard in my whole life, never. And my days are interviews like this one and you know, virtual meetings and conferences and um, sending out video messages to people and, and doing, um, you know, writing articles. I mean, it just doesn't stop. But every day at lunchtime, I have a very special little interlude. So I take the old dog out, but he doesn't like to go very far. He's 15 and he didn't like walking even when he was young. But then I come back, my lunch is like half a bit of toast and a bit of cheese and maybe a tomato. And, um, but I, I don't know how it started to happen, but every day at lunch, a little robin comes. I'm sitting underneath the beech tree that I used to climb as a child. And it's nice and dim and green under the tree and there's you know dead leaves on the ground and there's a lovely little branch and the robin comes and sits on that branch and I sing to him or well, it might be a she you can't tell I, I think it's a I think it's a he and sometimes he'll sing back so I sing a little bit and stop and he sings a little bit and stop and I sing a little and I'm just singing rubbishy things but just so people know um, this is actually Christmas. They, they're they very, very good Christmas card birds. And um, so it's not the American robin, it's the English robin redbreast. And it, it's just so special. It's really, really special. Well, I love that. It comes uh, full circle, but I remember the story about you being out watching the chickens 
as a child trying to figure out where the egg comes from and uh, your mother being quite worried about you being gone. Four hours yeah. I was hiding in a hen house. Four hours aged four. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Oh, that's that's when, that was my first real observation of animal behavior and it was so exciting. I can still see the egg coming out even now. Incredible. Well, let me know if you see a robin egg. So, um, well, this is our 10th expo and I always love October's because it means I get to spend some time with Jane. Uh, usually it's at, uh, you know, in an auditorium, having a little scotch afterwards. Um, but I remember the, the very first expo we were, WCN was a, a staff of two and uh, we had just a couple hundred people at the local community college and you've been with us and so supportive over the last 20 years as, as we've grown and we're so thankful and appreciative for, for all you've done for all the conservationists. So thank you for that. Well, I would thank you and WCN as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, part of WCN, of course, is about the next generation of conservationists. And selfishly, I would love for you and I just to continue this conversation, but I'd like to bring in one of the WCN conservationists to have a chat with us. Uh, he gave a terrific talk a little bit earlier this morning, uh, Dr. Pablo Baborglu from Global Penguin Society in Argentina. And there's Poppy. Hello, Poppy. Hello, Charlie. How are you? Hello, Jane. How are I'm you doing, too? I'm doing great. Great to see you. Um, All the better for seeing you too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, I um, um, would love to hear the conversations the two of you have, and I'll excuse myself from the screen for um, about a half an hour and uh, let you two uh, talk a little bit about uh, inspiration and the, the journeys and, and paths and the future of conservation, conservation leaders. So uh, now excuse myself. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie. And Jane, what a privilege for me to, to be talking to you today in another fantastic Wildlife Conservation Network Expo. And um, I have somebody here with me that wants to say hello. You know, he's a very good friend of Mr. H. <laughs> and yes. for the ones, okay, okay. is he around? Oh, yes. excellent. So they can see each other. <laughs> yes, they can even find a kiss. But... Yeah, there you go. There you go. So for the ones, Steve is the main character of the Disney Nature Penguins movie that uh, was launched uh, last year. And we had a fantastic time together in uh, New York with, with, with Jane. So Jane, I have a lot of interesting questions for you. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm so, all ready. Me and Mr. Excellent. Ed, we're both ready. We'll try and answer them between us. <laughs> excellent. So, <laughs> so the first question is about motivation, right? So, you know, in my case, the person that inspired me to work uh, and dedicate my life for, to conservation was my grandmother, because when I was a small boy, she used to tell me very nice and warm stories about her visits to penguins in here in Patagonia over a hundred years ago. So the question for you is, what was the original inspiration that you received and made you dedicate your life to conservation? Well, I think, you know, I was born loving animals. I was literally born that way. And when I was growing up, you know, a long time ago, and there was no television. So I spent a lot of time outside watching the birds and the squirrels and the little robins. In fact, I had one of those robins come into my bedroom and he made a nest in my bookcase, which was fantastic. Anyway, uh, so I, I learned a lot by watching the animals and birds around my home. Luckily, we have a big garden. Uh, but then there were books. And so I, I read every book about animals I could. And I don't know if you ever read Dr. Doolittle, but that, gosh, uh, he learned animal language. I wanted to learn animal language. And then when I was 10, I managed to save up enough pocket money. World War II was raging then. And I'd found this little second-hand bookshop and I found this very small book, Tarzan of the Apes, and I had just enough money to buy it. 
and took it home, read it from cover to cover. And that was when my dream began. I will grow up, I will go to Africa, I will live with wild animals, I will write books about them. There was no thought of being a scientist. Girls weren't scientists back then. And everybody laughed at me. How would I do that with no money, Africa far away? Uh, and I was just a girl. But my mother, my amazing mother, who's here behind me, uh, she just said to me, if you really want to do something like this, then you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And then maybe if you don't give up, you'll find a way. So she was my great support. And I think she helped me to be who I am because she had this, you know, this faith in, in me and what I could do at a time when girls weren't supposed to do anything like that. So that's how it all began for me. That's a really amazing story. And, and it shows the impact of those messages that we receive from very special people, persons close to us when, when we are young, right? When we are boys. So it, now I'm going to quote you. I'm going to read something that you said a long time ago. I'm going to read it. I don't want to make any mistake. And you said, a sense of calm came over me and more often I found myself thinking, this is where I belong. This is what I came into this world to do. So my question to you is, of all the fantastic and amazing things, Jane, that you have done during your life, what is that accomplishment that you are proudest of? And, and why? What is the reason why you choose specifically that accomplishment? Okay, well, actually there are two, but let me start off with the fact that studying chimpanzees, of course, was a dream come true. And it was very difficult at first. They ran away from me. They'd never seen a white ape before. And I was getting more and more worried. There was not very much money. I didn't want to let Dr. Lewis Leakey down. He was my mentor. Uh, and then one amazing chimpanzee. And again, I have them all around me, these special individuals. He showed me that chimps can use and make tools, which back then was thought to be something which only humans could do. And at first, the scientists they said, well, why should we believe her? She hasn't been to college. She's just a girl. But because of that tool using, National Geographic sent uh, a, a photographer and cameraman out, Hugo van Lauwek, and they gave money for me to carry on with the research. And once the scientists had, A, read my detailed descriptions of chimp behavior as I got to know them, and their personalities and so on. And then they saw Hugo's footage, they had to believe. And so coming to what I'm proudest of, the chimpanzees actually helped me to change the mentality of science. Because when Leakey sent me to Cambridge to get a PhD, I, I was nervous, I hadn't been to, to college at all. And the professors told me I'd done everything wrong, Jim should have had numbers, not names. I couldn't talk about personality, mind, or emotion. Those were unique to us, they said. But I'd been taught, again, I have him with me, my dog, Rusty, as a child. He taught me, of course, the professors are wrong in this. And mm -hmm. so once the chimpanzees, so like us biologically as well as behaviorally, had forced science to come out of that reductionist way of thinking that opened the door to people young i mean the students today can study animal personality study animal mind and as for animal animal intelligence that's just skyrocketing with amazing discoveries and in the intelligence of pigs and birds and octopus and i'm sure penguins <laughs> but we'll talk, you can tell me about that but anyway um, so that's one thing I feel quite proud about. And the other one is starting a program for youth, which is called Roots and Shoots. And maybe we talk about that later. But it's a program for young people from kindergarten through university that's now in 65 countries, including in Argentina. It's growing quite fast there. And um, so it, it's changing lives. 
and it's bringing up a group of young people who understand about conservation and animals and they're really making a difference. So those two things I want to be remembered for. Excellent, Jane. And definitely those are great things to be very proud of. It's, it's amazing and we are so grateful for all your contribution. So at some point in your answer, you mentioned funding, right? And you know, uh, as, as, we, as I do that, conservation actions, they require, they demand a lot of resources and funding. Mm -hmm. and, but, and one of the most critical challenges for, for conservationists is to ask for money, to, to fundraise uh, by ourselves. What is the, the main advice that you would give uh, conservationists to conquer new circles and encourage more people to support conservation? Well, um, telling stories, getting the news out. Uh, you know, I've written many books about the chimpanzees, so people became absolutely fascinated. And you won't believe this, but when I began uh, way back in the mid-60s, scientists were absolutely not allowed to write a popular book. And I was nearly sent down from Cambridge because I did write a popular book. It was part of the agreement with Geographic. And I said to my supervisor, I said, but every word in this book is as true as I know. Just because it's not in scientific jargon and peer-reviewed, and so of course now people write books and it's these books and mm. and radio and, and um, videos that help people to really understand and hopefully recognize the importance and that's why WCN is so important bringing the scientists from the field in touch with people who are interested and want to help support. Excellent Jane. And, and on, on that line, um, well, it, when we read about you and your story, and when we read about the, the work of many conservationists, we see that um, we have to face difficult circumstances. And many times to accomplish our goals, we have to work against m many odds. So what would be your advice? I, I mean, how do you keep positive? How can you keep positive when you are undergoing a very difficult circumstances and when things get very complicated? Well, I guess I'm a very obstinate person by nature. And when I come up against obstacles, it makes me even more determined. I will not let them defeat me. And of course, funding has been a major problem. And it's been hard for me to learn how to ask for money until I realized I'm not asking money for myself. I'm asking money to, to save the chimpanzees and the forest where they live. And mm -hmm. then to go on with, you know, with the idea of the story, realizing when I flew over Africa in 1990, that not only were the chimps in big trouble with forests disappearing, but also the people had to cope with crippling poverty and no good health and education and degradation of the land and flying over Gombe and seeing what had been forest all around the tiny national park was bare hills and that's when I realized that we don't involve the local people help them to find ways of living without destroying the environment in order to live then we can't even save the chimpanzees and so that began our program, which is now in six African countries and very, very successful. But, um, you know, some of the obstacles, like four of my students, when I had a research center, were kidnapped. And that was tough, uh, and, you know, but uh, because all my supporting, my funding pulled out. So I just had to go around with hat in hand and beg for money to keep it going. And fortunately, the Geographic came in and helped and some other wonderful people. But all the time, I mean, now, I think every person studying animals or, or working to conserve animals and their habitats, we're all coming up against corporate and government, you know, this crazy idea that you can have unlimited economic development on a planet of finite natural resources. And so efforts to save the environment will 
almost always be trampled by this bottom line mentality. It's, it's greed. I mean, it was Mahatma Gandhi who said, uh, the planet can provide the human need, but not human greed. And we are, mm. we are plundering nature's natural resources, which are finite, faster in many places than nature can replenish them. And at the same time, human populations are growing, 7.2 billion of us now, estimated um, 9.7 billion in 2050. We have unsustainable lifestyles on one hand and poverty on the other. And if you're really poor, you're going to destroy the environment to try and live. So these are the problems we have to face and the harder they get, the more I feel in fighting mode because, you know, but, but, but not only that, it's so important to give people hope. If you don't have hope, then what's the point? Eat, drink and be merry, but tomorrow we die. So it's my job, I think now, my job is to give people enough hope that there is a window of time. And if we get together, we can somehow win out. We must. Exactly. So, yeah, you're right. Like, we give voice to the wildlife we want to protect, right? So that's why we go out to the world asking for funds to, to support uh, the conservation of these species that we study and, and, and we love. And, 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 and talking about complications and how to bring hope, right? I think that conservationists, we are, by definition, optimists, right? So we yeah. kind of had a, a key, yeah. <laughs> We had to, we have to, uh, but all, even during the pandemic, we had a key role like to be, to become hope believers, not only for wildlife, but for the planet. So what do you think, uh, of course, I'm talking about the pandemic and it was shocking, overwhelming for all the planet. What do you think was the main lesson learned uh, by humanity, but also what have you learned personally uh, from the pandemic? Well, I've learned to communicate virtually, which is the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> to talk to you through this little spot on the top of my laptop. But, but um, you know, I think what I'm hoping that more and more people are, are beginning to understand. For one thing, when there was this shutdown, nature kind of came back and the air got cleaner and people could see stars for the first time in the big cities and animals appeared on the streets in some places. So it shows how resilient nature is. But, you know, the other thing is that in many ways, we brought this pandemic on ourselves. It isn't, wasn't something unexpected. The scientists of these zoonotic diseases that jump from animals to people they've been predicting a, a pandemic of this sort for, for a very, very long time. And as we destroy the environment, we force animals in closer contact with people. And sometimes this provides an environment for a pathogen to jump from an animal to a person where it may form some kind of a relationship with a cell in the human body and make a new disease. Uh, and then we've disrespected animals. We've hunted them, eaten them. We've uh, moved deeper and deeper into the forest. We've created conditions, again, suitable for bacteria to jump from one to the other viruses. We traffic them. We uh, sell them from different parts of a region or different parts of the world in the wildlife markets of Asia, the bushmeat markets of Africa. There's the international pet trade where all kinds of exotic animals are sold in these, in these markets. And these markets provide such an ideal place for the virus, COVID-19, jumping from an animal to a person, creating this pandemic that is so contagious, it's spread all around the world. And you know, it was really good that Chinese has closed down these wildlife markets, but we've got a long way to go. And I hope people are 
are understanding that as we move out of the pandemic, which we will, we need to have a new relationship with animals and with the environment. And we need to somehow work together to create a new green economy where everything isn't always measured in economic success. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And, uh, and I think all the, all the things that you mentioned, they, it's clear that this pandemic was caused by the way we abused nature and that we, we didn't respect the planetary limits and we thought it was going to be okay forever. But it is not, right? It is not. So, but the good thing is like, one, one of the silver linings here is that I can see, and, and I'm sure you're gonna agree with me that the, the new generations, they are more aware and they're more concerned about the conservation status of wildlife and of environments. So for those new generations that want to dedicate their lives to conservation, or even for people that just want to make some kind of contribution to conservation. What would be your advice? What, what, they, what could they do to, to help conservation globally? Okay, well, I'll answer, but then you're going to answer that as well, because you know, you work with youth as well. And this is all about what I think, it's what you think too, even more. Okay, okay. But um, roots and shoots, well, the, the reason that it, it's so successful, I think, is that, you know, when I was in the rainforest, I came to understand how everything is interrelated and losing one little species can lead to ecosystem collapse. And so when we began Roots and Shoots in 1991, it was a gathering of young people and they were concerned about all kinds of different things, the illegal dynamiting, which was destroying the coral reefs, the poaching in the national parks, the government not taking action, the street children who didn't have homes, the abuse of stray dogs and cats. So Roots and Shoots, which is kindergarten, university and everything in between, the young people discuss what they care about, work on projects that will address these issues and then roll up their sleeves and get out there and take action. So between them, they choose three different kinds of projects. One to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. And at the same time, growing up as a result of their gathering together, they're coming to understand that far more important than the color of the skin, the culture, the religion, is the fact that we're all human beings, that we all share one planet, that we all have, you know, similar hopes and dreams. We don't all, but you know what I mean. So now, now it's, you know, the, the, the young people care because they understand the problems. So when I was young, I didn't understand the problems because they didn't really exist, or perhaps in very minor form once they understand and they are empowered to take action and we listen to their voices, now they, they're coming and, and I, I truly think they're, they're, they're um, you know, coming up with solutions in a, in a new and exciting way. But tell me about your, in your program for young people because I know you work with them too. Yes, exactly. So yes, we, when we work on penguins, we realize that in most of the communities and the kids that live close to penguin areas, only a few percentage of them have ever had the chance to visit them. So we have our program where we take kids from, from those cities and, and towns to visit the penguin colonies. Uh, we have our own uh, education material. We teach the teachers as well. And, and so far we've been able to take seven, almost 7,000 kids because it's, as you said, you know, it's important that they value them, they recognize the needs of the penguins. And through the penguins, we want, to, we want them to um, develop a conservation culture. The penguins are ambassadors for the oceans. The oceans cover most part of this planet. So we talk about many issues. And, uh, and it's been amazing because, well, we started the problem almost 15 years ago, and they are grown-ups. They, they, they became decision-makers. They are now deciding about the future of those 
of, 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 those, of those animals and the, and the environment. Um, and when, 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 when I get asked the same question, what would I tell to these young generations? Uh, I would say that they, have, they just have to follow their vision. They just have to believe in what they think is important, to be unafraid of challenges, and also to train, as you were mentioning before, to train your, they have to train themselves to, to be effective and to be useful for the conservation, for the animals they want to protect. And, and always follow the dream, because if the, somebody said, if you can dream it, you can make it true. Yeah, but right. I, I, yeah, there are two things that make me very hopeful for the future. One is these new generations, you know, they are, you know, the millennials, the generation Z, all the, these kinds of generations, they are different because they live different things. And the generation that is living now this pandemic, they have now this conservation thing. They are seeing the pandemic and they can see their, the roots, you know, the causes of that. So I'm hopeful because they will have this, this concern, conservation concern in their emotional DNA. And they're going to be responsible citizens and responsible uh, adults. That, that's why I'm hopeful. And also for technology. I think technology will solve a lot of problems we created and avoid others. <laughs> well, that, you, those are two of my reasons for hope. The youth and mm. technology, you know, solar power, wind power, and all these other amazing technologies that are, are coming up because we have this incredible intellect which makes us more different from other animals than anything else. Um, unfortunately, we've, we haven't been very clever despite our intellect being <laughs> destroying our only home. But there's, then there's the resilience of nature. You know, when I flew over Gombe and saw a little island of forest surrounded by bare hills, which had been one big forest, um, I, I started this program, or the Jane Goodall Institute did, to Kari and take care to Kari. And that uh, got the, the villagers understanding that protecting the forest was important for their future, not just wildlife. And we've given them uh, GIS, GPS, they use smartphones, they monitor the health of their forests where most of the chimps are. They become our partners. And if you fly over that area today, you don't see the bare hills, trees come back. Animals on the brink of extinction can be given another chance. And I think your penguin colony in, uh, in Patagonia, I think you said it started with, I don't know, six, 10 individuals, and now you've got over a thousand. So it just shows you with, with help. And you know what's fascinating? Your work and my work, we have almost totally opposite environments. I'm thick for this dim. And your wide open spaces, uh, your forest, I mean, I'm forest, your ocean, but both forests and oceans do the same job or they should do, absorbing carbon dioxide and giving us oxygen. And as we pollute the oceans, that those, it becomes harder and harder for them to do that job. And as we destroy the forest, they're releasing all the carbon back into the atmosphere. So, you know, one thing we, we talked about the pandemic, bringing it upon ourselves because of our disrespect for nature and animals. And it's our disrespect for nature that's led to the climate crisis. I mean, you know, we can't go on and on cutting down forests and polluting the ocean. We've just got to change that. And that's where, you know, your reasons for hope and mine, the technology, um, the young people, and I always say to the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible and won't give up. And th there's all kinds of people. Sometimes they're battling with terrible physical disabilities. And gosh, some of them are so inspirational. Mm. You know, there's, there's something about us humans. We can't give in. We must succeed. We have to. And we mustn't give up. And we have to encourage everybody else not to give up. Absolutely. Very wise, very wise words. And, and, and I agree with you that uh, the, the young generations are also realizing that we are facing global problems. I mean, this virtual world where we are right now, 
I mean, the, the new generations, they manage this perfectly well because the, their perspective is global. So they can understand global problems better. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the future, Jane. You know, like if we see conservation, like 50 years ago, we, conservation was about like fencing areas against people, managing, treating people and communities like the enemy. Then we moved into a conservation that included the communities and you had a key role in, in, in changing the concept of, of, of conservation, considering the needs of the people. Hmm? How do you think conservation should go now? How, what do you think would be the next kind of wave in conservation? What is the next thing that conservation should focus on? Well, um... I think we're sort of focusing on the right things. And fortunately, you know, there are different people tackling different aspects of conservation. You know, some of them are trying to preserve endangered species. Some are reintroducing them into the wild. Of course, that means protecting the habitat and sometimes restoring the habitat. And restoration of the habitat is something tremendously important. There's the rewilding, and certainly examples in the UK where areas that were farmed and, you know, with all these terrible chemical pesticides and fertilizers, destroying the soil, destroying the future, really. And now some of those areas are being given back, and nature has reclaimed them. Animal species have come back. And you know, we're beginning to move more into permaculture and ways of working with nature in our farming. And I can't not mention meat eating, which in Argentina is kind of difficult, isn't it? With yeah. all the cattle. Yeah. But I've seen with my own eyes in my few visits to Argentina, places which were forests which have become degraded because of cattle grazing, exactly the same in Africa. And one factory farming puts animals crowded in horrible conditions, and that too has led to many of these zoonotic diseases. But not only is it horribly cruel, and you know, we do have to realize that each one of these farmed animals is a sentient being. Each one has a personality and can feel fear and pain at the very least. And so these billions of animals have to be fed. Huge areas are cleared to grow the grain to feed them. And then of course there's all the cattle ranching as well. And lots of fossil fuel used to get the, the uh, grain to the animals, to the abattoir, meat to the table. And they're producing methane gas. So yes, most of these so-called greenhouse gases are CO2, aren't they, from fossil fuel burning. But methane is another really important uh, greenhouse gas, and that's from digestive pro processes of all these billions of farmed animals. Well, for all, from all of us, actually, but you know, especially cattle, who not only have gas one end, but they belch the other end. So, I yeah. Always, yeah, I always carry with me, this is cow, the cow helps, <laughs> me, cow, cow helps me tell children about this uh, problem and I always say gas comes out here, which makes them right. giggle. You've got to bring humour into some of these tough problems. Yeah, of course, of course, because we need to reach the emotions and most of the, the problems we are facing are cultural problems, so we need a cultural uh, shift. But one yeah. concept that you mentioned and is critical, I think, is that uh, people that support conservation, uh, they have to realize that we work to protect the animal, but also the habitat, because it's like protecting a king without a kingdom, you know? So it's, it's intricated. It's, you know, one thing is linked to the other. You cannot protect a, a, a chimpanzee if you do not protect the, the habitat. That is why it's so critical um, to understand the, the the complexities of, of conservation. Yes, and, I, and the, no, I said yes. Uh, okay, so now it's a, I want to make a, a final question about, um, it could be personal, but if you have to choose the best moment of your life, 
And if you could go back to that moment and leave it again, what, what would that moment be? Is there something in mind that you can choose? There is. It was a, one of the most special and moving moments. And it was in the early days of the study at Gombe. It was still towards the end of 1960 or early 1961. I can't remember exactly. And this chimpanzee, David Greybeard, gradually let me come closer and eventually let me follow him, which was something different from sitting watching to actually following. That's a little more intrusive, right? Your penguins don't seem to mind. I've seen you picking them up and weighing them. <laughs> they, they seem to <laughs> which you couldn't do that with a chimpanzee, I can tell you. But anyway, <laughs> David was allowing me to follow him and I kept a reasonable distance and he chose to go through a horrible thorny thicket. And of course he just goes through and here I am getting tangled up with my hair and my clothes. And I thought, oh well, I'll find him another day. But when I finally pushed through, he was sitting and he was looking back. And it honestly looked as though he was waiting for me. I don't know, but that's what it looked like. So anyway, I sat down near him and between us, on the ground was a ripe red palm nut and chimpanzees love oil palm nuts. So <clears throat> I picked it up and I held it out to him on my hand and he turned his face away. So I put my hand closer and then he turned, he looked directly into my eyes and he reached out, he took the nut but he really didn't want it, he dropped it but at the same time he very gently squeezed my fingers and that's how chimpanzees reassure each other so in that moment we were communicating in a language that surely predates words in our combined evolution and he understood that i was having good intentions in offering him the nut even though he didn't want it and i understood that he understood and I think it was that moment when, looking back, that made me feel that I had to dedicate my life to helping these, these so close uh, relatives of ours. And that, of course, led me to, I always wanted to study all animals. But anyway, that was a very, very special moment. That is great, really moving. Jane, thank you so much for sharing that moment with us. Yes, lovely, lovely. And Can we, have we got time to ask Poppy what his most special moment was? Of course we do. Oh, <laughs> now I'm the victim of my own questions. <laughs> yeah. uh, so I, I think there, there are two briefly. One is when 30 years ago, there was a very big oil spill. I was studying at the university and I set up a rehabilitation center and uh, I wanted to do something and I set up this center. And uh, when we released the, the first penguin rehabilitated, we found him completely covered by oil, almost dying. Uh, and after the rehabilitation, when we released that animals, I, it was like an eureka moment. I said, if I, if, if we, with this small action, I can kind of release this animal back in the wild and it's gonna live for 30 years maybe. I could do big things. I could expand, I could help a lot of penguins. And that was, was also one of the things that helped me, uh, you know, pursue my career and, and work in conservation. And the other one is in this colony that you mentioned before that we found, discovered, it was, it was there was a, a lot of human disturbance, you know, people with ATVs, garbage, people uh, uh, coming with dogs, harming the penguins. So we protected and it grew from a few penguins under 10 to almost 3000 penguins. And again, when, I, when, when we go to these colonies, and of course they don't thank you <laughs> because they don't know, but you feel the energy of those, of those places. Yeah? And, and you realize that, I mean, if you do something, there's a big, reward and we can make a difference. Everybody can make a difference, even with small actions. The, those are my favorite moments, Jane. Oh, thank you for sharing those, Poppy. Thank you, Poppy. And uh, 
Thank you, Poppy, Thanks. for not only your time today, but for your hard work, your inspiration, your commitment. You, um, when you asked about the future of conservation, it's, it's people like you. It's the next generation of people from local communities and empowering them and helping them help us save, save the world. So thank you for that, Poppy. And Jane, thank you. thank you for your time today. Jane, thank you for all you've done for WCN. But I think I can speak on behalf of all the people attending the expo and all the people in the world to say that we really want to thank you deeply for inspiring us, for giving us hope, and for really being a North Star for what it means to, as us as humans, to live a life full of purpose and meaning. So thank you, thank you for that. And um, one of my greatest moments is meeting you and the time we get to spend together. So it's absolutely been a joy. Well, Love thank you, you Johnny. And have a whiskey with me tonight, okay? <laughs> I will have a whiskey with you. And um, to our Expo viewers, our next uh, presentation will start at uh, 45 minutes past the hour, and we'll have Andy and cats and, and bears. So we look forward to seeing you then. But again, thank you, Jane. Uh, a pleasure as always. Cheers.